so this is an initiative that Athena Lamb, uh, our assistant director at the genomic facility uh, at Cal Academy started at the beginning of the pandemic. And we've been meeting basically every fourth night, uh, every time discussing a different theme related to genomics. And this is our first session uh, on sponges. Um, I also saw uh, a number of people that I, I don't recognize from the sponge research community. Um, so just a few words about sponges. Uh, sponges are one of the oldest animals evolutionary. Uh, there are more than uh, 9,000 uh, species known. Uh, they have widespread ecological and biogeochemical functions um, in the deep sea, in tropical coral reefs, in freshwater systems, in, in, in many ecosystems around the world. And uh, our speakers will be touching a bit today on um, the adaptations of sponges to be thriving and also their microbial communities to be thriving uh, in such um, habitats. Um, but despite the importance of sponges, there's actually not a lot of um, genomic resources available yet. Uh, we have a few genomes and a few transcriptomes. Um, so we will also hear some insights um, about animal evolution that we have gained from both nuclear uh, and mitochondrial analyses that have taken place so far. And at the same time, we're also excited to hear more about future plans um, that are coming up um, to actually get more uh, sponge genomes. Um, so just a few logistical notes before we continue. Uh, please remember to keep your uh, video and microphone off uh, during the talks. Uh, we'll go through the three talks and we'll have a, a Q&A uh, at the end of the session. Um, so then if you want to ask a question to the speakers, uh, you can either raise your hand with the Zoom function or type a question mark in the chat box and I'll call on you and you can unmute yourself um, and ask your question. Um, I also want to say that uh, this session is being recorded. So if any of the participants does not want to be recorded, now would be the time to hop off and um, you can come back and watch the session uh, later. So I think that's all from me. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today. That's Dr. Nathan Kenny. Uh, he's a research fellow at the moment at Oxford Brookes uh, University in the UK. And his work uh, sort of lays at the crossroads of comparative genomics, phylogenetics and evolutionary biology. And he's done such studies in a range of invertebrates, including sponges. And so today he will be talking to us about um, uh, the genome of a freshwater sponge that has been uh, very recently published. So uh, Nathan, the floor is yours. If you wanna share your screen, I'll stop sharing mine. Thank you very much, Michelle, for the lovely introduction and for organizing this. Um, looks like there's all sorts of interesting talks here. And thank you everyone for joining, uh, whether it's coffee clock or beer clock, where you guys are. Um, I appreciate taking the time uh, to come uh, and join uh, and learn all about sponges and everything um, there is to know about uh, sponge genomics, or at least as far as we've got so far. So, uh, well, I'm continuing the thanks. I'd just like to say thank you to a whole bunch of people who are also involved in this work. Um, sorry, I'm just going to start my timer before I forget. Um, so I'd particularly like to thank Anna Riesco and Warren Francis, who were instrumental in driving this work forward. And uh, last in the paper, but certainly not least, Sally Lays, who was the driving force behind putting this team together, um, uh, organizing this research, and most importantly, paying for the sequencing and getting everything done. Um, so without these people, uh, this uh, research would not have come together in the excellent way that it did. So thank you to all of them. So Michelle's already gone over a bit about sponges and I realize that I'm possibly preaching to the converted here about sponges. So I don't need to go into all the things that I normally go into about how, yes, they are actually animals. Um, but despite the very simple body plan and relatively few tissues or organs, they are genomically very complex, um, as complex as any other animal and more complex than some. Um, 
so we are learning more and more about sponges as the sort of uh, DNA sequencing revolution goes on. Um, but it, an important thing to remember when you're looking or interpreting things in sponge data and where they are really important is for polarizing the evolution of animal characters. Now, there's a big controversy uh, in phylogenomics of metazoans about whether sponges or tenophores lie at the base uh, as sister taxa to all other animals. The answer to this, well, it's really important, really interesting, is not what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, but regardless of whether it's uh, peripheral sponges or tenophores that lie at the base of the tree of life for realsies, uh, no matter which of these are actually at the base or sister taxa to everything else, uh, sponges are definitely really important for polarizing animal characters. We can learn a lot from their genomes. Um, if something's in sponges and in tenophores, we can be reasonably confident that it existed at the dawn of the metazoa. Um, and we can also use these as outroots for understanding how characters have subsequently evolved. So really important to know and to find out. So we're not the first people to look at sponge genomes. And over 10 years ago, the genome of Amphimidon Queenslandica, which is still the senior resource in the community, was published. Uh, now, this, from this sponge genome, we found out that sponge gene complements are quite big. About 40,000 genes in Amphimidon Queenslandica is about twice what you find in most other species. It's about one and a half times what you find in a human. Um, and so this is an extensive complement but there are some things missing, um, which can uh, perhaps give you uh, hints about what things didn't quite exist at the base of the animal tree of life, uh, but all major transcription factor families present. Uh, sponges, as far as we understand, have compact genomes. Amphimidon has a, a genome of 166 megabases, relatively small introns, and not too much in the way of alternative splicing. A highly methylated genome, however, and I'll come back to that later. But uh, the important things coming into this project, we had no well scaffolded resource. As good as the Amphimidon Queenslandica genome is, uh, it's not hugely contiguous. And that means that inferring ancestral characters, especially genome wide, is not easy. And those species, including Amphimidon, uh, that are sequenced aren't easy to work on, especially for long range synteny and things. So all sponges contain. Uh, symbiotes and other things that live in or eat or live with uh, sponges. We'll learn more about these in the uh, next talk, I'm sure. Um, but all of this can make genome assembly difficult. So that's where Ephidatia mulleri came in. So Ephidatia is a freshwater sponge. Freshwater sponges are unusual in that they have these structures called gemules, which are the small white dots you can see here, which allow them to reproduce asexually. So this is not a fried egg, this is a developing juvenile Ephidatia. Um, so these gemules have allowed them to spread widely across at least the Northern Hemisphere and there's uncorroborated, uncorroborated reports of Ephidatia in the Southern Hemisphere as well. Um, and green are the spaces that there's definitely Ephidatia mulleri, and they can travel around um, both in water and maybe through the actions of waterfowl. So important to remember as well, they can reproduce asexually, as I've noted, but they also retain the means to reproduce sexually. They produce sperm and eggs, and like other sponges can also reproduce in that way. So the genome contains all the things necessary for that as well. The great thing about Ephidatia is uh, you can use these gemules um, to work um, in ways that you can't work with other sponges. So these gemules can be frozen, uh, their design, well, the, the way they work in the wild is they allow uh, these sponges to survive desiccation and cold. So you can freeze these gemules, you can send them to your mate across the other side of the world, who can then hatch them uh, in water in their own labs. And this is really important for uh, genomic uh, sequencing in a way that I'll come to very soon. Um, and that means that you and your friends can work through the same clones. Now, where did we get these from? Um, so Sally, who I mentioned earlier, uh, was invited along to this Kapoor tunnel, uh, which is in British Columbia and supplies water to a few surrounding cities. Um, inside this tunnel, which gets cleaned once a year, uh, are thousands of Ephidatia that line the walls. Um, and uh, if you have a close look at these, interestingly, uh, when you consider that a lot of sponges have symbiotes, 
These don't have the algae um, because they're in the dark that you'd normally find um, in a lot of sponges that you collect in the wild. So you add together the fact that you can take gemmules and hatch them in aseptic conditions and that you've got sponges that you've collected from the wild without at least some of their symbiotes. And you've got a really good candidate for genomic sequencing because it doesn't have uh, some of the uh, contribution from other species that normally makes genomic sequencing difficult. So we started with a, a clone of Ephidatia um, and hatched it and extracted DNA. And then went, as you do when you're doing a genomic sequencing project, uh, paid a whole lot of money to someone, in this case, Dovetail Genomics. Uh, they made an initial assembly with PacBio and then scaffolded with two different kinds of uh, long range libraries, Chicago and Dovetail High C libraries, um, and used high rise scaffolding for a final assembly. And this final assembly was excellent. So there are a few things that I'd like to draw your attention to here. Uh, firstly, is the number of scaffolds. Um, in a well assembled genome, you have less scaffolds, and you can tell that if a data is significantly less than some of it, some other uh, genomes that you can see here. Um, it will also have a high N50, um, and it is a lot higher than uh, these other resources. Um, now, uh, remember that there are about a thousand scaffolds. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but there are also about 40,000 gene models. So again, as with Amphimidon, uh, we see a relatively small genome, but with a lot of genes within it. Now, I mentioned just before that there were about 1,400 gene models. Um, this is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, at 1,400 contigs, the scaffolds within this genome. Um, this is a bit of a misnomer because almost all of the assembly, about 85% of it, is only in 24 of these scaffolds. Um, this corresponds pretty well to the 23 chromosomes of this species. And what we've probably got here is uh, one chromosome that's been split at the centromere uh, to give 24 scaffolds rather than 23. So this is a really good assembly. Um, sponge genomes are generally smaller than other metazoan genomes, as I've mentioned before. Um, this is not due to smaller genes. When we look at exon lengths, they're about the same. It's actually the introns and the intergenic spaces that are far, far smaller in Ephidatia and Amphimidon. You can see that um, in green and purple are these two species. Um, these are much smaller. Exons are about the same smart size. So quite compact genomes. So when we look at the gene content, we have about 40,000 genes, as I mentioned before. We can blast these to the NR database and about 30,000 of them receive a good hit. Um, about half of these receive a best hit to peripheral, other sponges. Um, so you can see the distribution of this here. A few best hits are to a few other species, but, and, um, but we have about 10,000 genes that don't have a good hit in the NR database. That's a sizable amount of genomic dark matter, about 10,000 genes that we don't know a function for. So um, these are really important things for looking into when looking at sponge novelties. We can use this resource to examine well-known gene pathways. And then uh, our genome paper, we've dug into this in a large degree. Um, but here you can see one example, WINT signaling and greens that are present in Ephidatia. Orange genes are uh, genes that are absent, but they might, they're not necessarily expected to be found in Ephidatia. They might've been uh, lost or not yet evolved in sponges. So uh, you can see that the core parts of the pathway are present in our resource and thus were present in sponges and thus present in metazoans at the base of the metazoa. So compared to the wider metazoa, sponges have smaller genomes, more genes, but much the same pathways. And lots of their genes still have an unknown function. So how does this genome help us to understand shared animal characters? So first, we can use this to understand how genes are arranged in genomes. Um, this is called, uh, so when things are in similar organizational patterns in multiple animals. This is called uh, conserved synteny. So this is an Oxford. Each green is a gene that's found on this axis in Ephidatia and this axis in Trichoplax. And where you get clusters of genes in close proximity that are shared in homologous molecules between these species, you get the, these little squares. So we've got one example of this here. This is scaffold 22 in Ephidatia, scaffold five in Trichoplax. And you can see that these genes have been shuffled, but they are all on the same uh, uh, molecules. So 
this is evidence that things like long range interactions and uh, conserved regulatory mechanisms may be held in common between these animals. Another example of things that we can learn from this resource that we couldn't learn from a more fragmented resource, um, uh, the long range genomic interactions. Um, you can get this from your high C data. So uh, in this plot, uh, regions that interact a lot on the scaffold, this is the same scaffold on the X and Y axes. So where there's a lot of interactions, um, you get more red, where there's not much interactions, you see white. Um, and you get these what are called topologically associated domains, um, which also exist in mouse, in Drosophila, in some species of plant, but not Arabidopsis, and not so much in, uh, in single-celled organisms. You get these in Ephidatia, which is uh, at, at least suggestive of the fact that long-range interactions are found um, more widely across the animal kingdom. Um, and this is an excellent starting point for future investigations. Sponges also have more highly methylated genomes than other invertebrates. So we know that uh, vertebrates have really highly methylated genomes. So here, all these colors are regions that are high, more less uh, methylated. Um, here we see that sponges, so these three species here, have relatively high levels of methylation compared to other invertebrates that you might go and look at. Um, so again, we can start to polarize these animal traits and suggest that maybe they're shared more generally across the animal kingdom. So macrocentinae is conserved across animals. Sponges have vertebrate-like methylation patterns and animals have shared characteristic genome architectures, which are great things to learn. So if the data is unusual in that it's a freshwater sponge, um, so it will have some things in its genome that are different to sponges that you'll find in marine environments. So we went looking for these. So partially what we found uh, is that gene loss and gain is really prevalent in sponges in general, but in freshwater sponges in particular. So you get these bursts of shared uh, expansions of genes at the base of, so all of these species are freshwater species of sponge. Um, you get expansions in other sponges, but this is particularly pronounced. So, um, when we look at which kind of genes uh, these expansions are, often they're membrane spanning genes. So here's an example, a GABA B receptor. So there is a cluster of around 120 of these genes, all on scaffold 22. So each dot here is another copy of GABA B that's found either in sense or antisense, sense in green, antisense in purple, um, to, the, uh, to the first copy that we noted. Um, you can see, again, signatures of this expansion when you plot these on a phylogeny. Uh, Demosponges as a whole have maybe one or two copies, um, but uh, freshwater demosponges have a whole lot of them. So lots of tandem duplication. We see this in lots of membrane-associated genes. Um, we were able to use tests of positive selection, and we used multiple tests of positive selection to rule out false positives. Um, so there's a few of the programs we used here. The most convincing evidence is when every program you look at gives, a, um, it gives the same answer. And not all tests pinpointed the same genes and not all tests pinpointed the same locations, but we were able to agree on some genes and they tended to be membrane associated or signaling associated genes that are under strong selective pressure. Um, and that makes sense when you consider that going from a marine environment to a freshwater environment will change uh, the osmotic pressure across your membranes quite a lot and require a lot of tweaks to your genes. So this genome tells us a lot about the peculiarities of freshwater evolution. Gene duplication is prevalent. So lots of genes that are with uh, roles in sensing and responding to the environment, membrane associated genes. And some of these genes are under profound selective pressure. So um, just one quick plug before I say goodbye to you all. Um, please go to Ethibase, which is our genome hub with all the data and associated uh, links that you can ever wish to see. Um, so to check this out and please also read our paper, which came out in Nature Communications uh, about nine months ago. Um, in conclusion, we have a high quality assembly. Um, we've been able to look at animal, animal wide shared characters. Um, signatures of freshwater adaptation. And the great thing about Ephidatia is if any of these things are interested, it's interesting to you, 
you can uh, talk to Sally and get a clone of the particular sponge that we did the genome of, and she'll send those to you and you can hatch them at home. So thank you very much to all these kind people for helping me with this work and for all of you to listening. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nathan. That was great. I mean, what a great resource. So I think we'll keep the questions uh, for the end and we'll move on to our second speaker. Um, that is Dr. Beate Schlaubi. Uh, she has been a postdoctoral researcher at uh, Geomar in Kiel, Germany, uh, focusing on microbial omics in sponges. And so today um, she will talk to us about uh, her work on sponge symbiogenomics and she'll be focusing on uh, microbial strategies for survival in a glass sponge. So welcome, Beate. Thank you. And thanks for inviting me to this exciting seminar. So I'm going to start sharing. It's great to have you. All right, I can, I guess you all see that. So um, I'm now diving into the sponge a little bit um, and looking at the microbial communities that we find. So um, like pretty much every metazoan organism, um, also sponges are holobionts, so they are associated with a lot of different microbes. And we find a rather high diversity of microbes, usually in sponges. Um, but most of the studies have focused on demo sponges and not so much is known, for example, about glass sponges. So that is something we looked at here. First, a few words of um, where I'm from. So uh, as Michelle said, I'm from Geomar, which is located um, in northern Germany in Kiel, here at the Baltic Sea. Um, at a fjord, so the institute where I'm usually sitting, where my office is, is right here. You can see one of our research ships here. Uh, right now I'm in home office somewhere over there. Yeah, so that's the building. But let's get back to sponges. So um, we are dealing with a number of research questions. Um, for example, how do the symbionts that we find in these sponges influence the ecology and um, how did they also co-evolve with their sponge hosts? Then how are sponge and symbiont metabolisms intertwined? How are they depending on each other maybe? And um, how do sponges adapt to changing climate conditions and how are the symbionts involved in that? Do they play a role or maybe not? Um, in this study, we worked with Vasella Portalesi, which is building a monospecific sponge grounds along the Canadian shelf. So this is the Scotian shelf. This is the coast of Nova Scotia. Um, and this, in this square, you can see the study area. This figure shows um, the presence probability of the sponge species that has been um, studied in, in earlier work. And um, yes, where you see this bright, these bright yellow spots, it's most likely to find the sponge species and that's where we went to sample. Um, and we sampled these sponges in a specific water depth. So when you're look at, looking at this temperature salinity profile um, with rising Depth. So this is this is data along the going through the water column from top to bottom. Um, we are hitting different water masses, and here where you can see the dots, we sampled the sponges, and they were all sitting in this uh, warm slope water, which is rather warm, as the name says. So it's it's above ten degrees Celsius. It's rather nutrient rich and has rather low oxygen levels. So even in the range of mild hypoxia, hypoxia. This is what it looks like down there. Um, so this is Vasella portalesi as we sampled it. And you can see that it's not just sponges here, but there's a lot going on. So those sponges also provide um, breeding grounds, for example, for these fish and can be rather important in their ecosystem. 
Um, yes, and the sampling depth was around 160, 180 meters. Um, so this is already at the base of the euphotic zone. Not much light is getting there. The sampling took place in 2017 um, on board uh, the Martha L. Black. This is a, a Canadian research vessel. And along with sponges, we also sampled seawater and sediment for reference, especially when working with microbes, we want to make sure that we are not looking at something that is just abundant in the environment, but we want to make sure to look at microbes that are actually specific to the sponges or at least enriched in the sponges. Um, we also took temperature, salinity, and oxygen data with the CTD casts and also some additional water samples. So the sponges were sampled with um, ROVs. And we got additional sponge samples, which was a bit surprising, from these mooring floats um, where they were happily growing. All right, so we processed the samples when we got them back to the lab. Um, we did microscopy, so transmission electron microscopy and also light microscopy. We sequenced amplicons, so we sequenced the V3, V4 variable region of the 16S rRNA gene and um, processed this data in CHIME2 and um, yes, cluster two amplicon sequence variants. And um, most of my contribution here was metagenomics and binning of microbial genomes. So from a subset of this whole sampling campaign, um, from seven sponges and five seawater samples, we sequenced um, metagenomes with Illumina HiSeq sequencing technology, um, co-assembled everything with MegaHit, and then used the MetaRep pipeline to bin single genomes out of this data. So this pipeline is combining different um, initial binning algorithms and is refining these bins to get the best genomes that we can get. Um, and then to, just to improve it a little bit more, even um, the bins were reassembled with spades. And then for every bin, the best version was selected as a metagenome assembly genome, so as a MAC. Okay, let's get to the results of this. Um, looking at the microscopy, we first wanted to get an overview. So when you're looking here at panel A, you can see an SEM overview. You can see the uh, spicule scaffolds. So these sponges are made up of glass spicules, which are building the main structure. And um, usually the structure is lined with a syncytial tissue. So it's um, basically cytoplasm that is lining these spicules. And within the cytoplasm, there are single sponge um, cell cores, basically. So it's like one connected cell. Um, and here you can see that this biomass is in patches, but we think this is an artifact from fixation. Um, nevertheless, when zooming into these patches, we don't only see sponge cells, but also a lot of microbial cells and um, different ones at that. Um, but what we realized is that those look much smaller than what we usually see in other sponges. Um, yes, so zooming into these patches, you can see that. And yes, I said that, so small cells are rather dominant. All right, the results of this metagenomics and binning. So I managed to bin 137 max out of this data that were at least 50% complete and had less than 10% redundancy. But that is still um, from sponges and seawater. And then um, we did some statistical analysis on these and uh, also on the amplicon data. 
to figure out which ones are the ones that are enriched in the sponges to make sure we're only looking at these. And we identified four groups that are dominant in the sponge species. And those were from the phyla um, Green Archaeota, Nano Archaeota, SAR324, and Patessi bacteria, which is an, a rather unusual phylum to be dominant in sponges. Um, and you can see where they are placed in the phylogenomic tree. Um, for example, the Green Archaeota, one of the mags is within um, the genus Nitro. Nitro Zopumulus, which is known from, from sponges. Um, Nanoarchaeota have not been noted in sponges before, as far as we are aware of. Also, SAR324 were new to us as a phylum. Um, yes, and as I said, the Patessi bacteria were also unusually dominant. So it looked like a rather unusual microbial community associated to the sponge species. And we decided to analyze the genomes of these four groups. The first thing that was interesting about these genomes in comparison, especially to um, symbionts from other sponges, were that they are rather small and have very low uh, GC contents. So you can see, um, the orange dots show where um, the data is um, for symbionts of Vasella portalesi. The blue dots show closely re related genomes from seawater. And the green dots show um, genomes of the same phylum from other sponge species. And it's pretty easy to see that all of the orange dots are somewhere in the lower left corner. So they have, at the same time, rather small genomes and also very, very low GC contents. Because we usually see rather high GC contents in sponge symbionts. So this was surprising. Um, I'm not going too much into detail about this genome analysis because it's just too much for the time to. Um, we noticed that um, there were two groups, the SAR324 and the Green Archaeota, that seemed to be pretty well equipped for sponge symbionts. Um, they were able to produce most or even all of the amino acids that are necessary and vitamins but they also seem to um, maybe even depend on each other for vitamin B production or other members of the microbial community. And then we have the Patessi bacteria and nanoarchaeota that are pretty much unable to produce any of the essential amino acids. Um, they have rather small genomes, so even unusually small. And um, they seem to depend on the microbial community around them or on substances in the sponge environment to survive. And um, yes, we came up with the hypothesis that of give us and take us in the end. So we call SAR324 and Green Archaeota the givers that are producing all the vitamins and amino acids and, and transporting them into the cytoplasm. Um, and then we have to take us potassium bacteria and nano archaeota. What was that? That are um, taking up nutrients and even pieces of DNA and working with those. And then looking at the microscopy again, we noticed that we see on a regular basis, smaller microbial cells sitting on larger ones. And even they seem even to be attached with a pilos, um, which is something that is known from other craniarchaeota, nanoarchaeota systems. So this is something that we would love to explore more 
maybe with labeling, uh, with fish labels or something like this. Um, so what's next? I promise to give a bit of a glimpse into the future. As we heard from Nathan, there are not many sponge genomes available. And this is, this is often the site that is missing when we want to look at interactions between microbes and sponges. Um, so we teamed up with the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and the Wellcome Sanger Institute to sequence quite a large number of sponge genomes along with their metagenomes. So in the next years, we will sequence the genomes of 50 more sponge species together with a consortium of international partners. All right, and um, I have to thank a lot of people um, that helped with this work. So printed in bold are my co-authors. And first and foremost, I also want to thank the Sponges EU project and especially Hans Torer Rapp. And um, yes, a lot of more people for their support. And I thanks, thanks again for letting me speak here. And I'm curious about your questions. Thank you so much, Beata. That was great. Uh, so we'll keep the questions um, all for the end. So let's move on uh, to the third and final talk. Uh, so our last speaker is Dr. Astrid Schuster. Uh, she's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Southern Denmark. And her research interests include molecular phylogenetics, population genetics, evolutionary ecology of sponges, and many more things. Um, but today she'll share with us uh, some of her insights on mitogenomics and the evolution of edible sponges. So thanks for joining us, Astrid, and um, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, you're still muted, Astrid. Oh yeah, sorry. I will just um, share my screen. Yes, um, thank you. Um... Yes, can we can see the screen now. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good. Um, okay, now you should uh, see the first slide. Yes, perfect. So, yeah, again, um, thanks for the invite also from my side. I think it's a great initiative to um, get again, uh, yeah, some sponge uh, discussions uh, going on. And uh, today I will just give you like a brief um, introduction of where we stand with the mitogenomics and the evolution of demo sponges. And of course, um, this is also not a work done completely by me. Um, it was, uh, with many collaborations, including also some results of my PhD projects, but also um, some new ones, uh, which I'm doing here now during my postdoc time. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, um, how does the genetic uh, map of a typical demo sponge look like? We have um, an example here of uh, Giudia Neptuni and um, the, no, like, a normal range size is between 16 and 25 kilobase pairs. Most of the, uh, or all of them are circular molecules in the demospongia, and they contain 13 to 15 protein coding genes. Two rRNAs and two to, 20, um, to 72 tRNAs. If we um, have a look um, at this very simplified um, um, phylogenetic, um, um, tree here, we, we see that uh, Percaria and Homoscleromorpha are uh, sister to the other Cilia, and it also um, shows here in the um, colored circle the different um, uh, changes. We have uh, linear chromosomes in the Calcaria, and within Demospongia we find uh, quite some losses of the tRNAs in certain uh, taxa, but we also see um, some gene 
uh, genetic code changes in the hexactinellids. And the bars indicate, so in black indicate the complete mitochondrial genomes, uh, what were known from 2016 compared to the described species. And you can see that we still are quite, um, yeah, we still lag a lot uh, if we compare it to what we know actually in terms of uh, the number of species. So 2021, we have about 7,700 7, uh, uh, accepted species and currently I counted uh, about 70 mitochondrial genomes. So you can see there's still a lot uh, to do, but today I want to um, yeah, just give you a, a, a brief overview of, of, of the mitochondrial genome, um, which you can also use in, uh, in the phylogenetic uh, reconstructions because the rates of the mitochondrial uh, genes are variable. And you can see here um, a phylogenetic reconstruction of the whole um, uh, basal animals, including uh, demosponges, hexactinellids, calcarea, but also the tenophores. And you can see that the rate of uh, evolution is different in those. And you can see that in the demospongia, it's less different than, for example, in the hexactinella or the calcarea, but you, you still see um, uh, variable rates. So the recovering mitochondrial genomes and sponges um, started with long range PCRs back in the times where we were busy in the labs for hours and hours trying to get good DNA and long, long, uh, yeah, long gene fragments, cloning and sequencing. So it was a whole lot of effort and with the increasing like uh, genomic access and new tools, we now managed to um, extract mitochondrial genomes from RADSEC data, from transcriptomes, metatranscriptomes, or even metagenomes. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of pipelines, bioinformatic pipelines that uh, um, evolved recently to make our life easier in um, extracting those, which uh, include, for example, here, the Trimomatics pipeline from uh, Bruna Plese from the Risco lab, but also another one, uh, it's called uh, um, yeah, the mite guard pipeline, um, and most of these um, are based on, on similar approaches, where you basically um, clean your reads, you um, either um, map it to already existing reference transcriptomes, and you have a complete one, or you have a partial one, and then it goes again into some other um, mapping tools and assemblies which include, for example, bowtie, velvet, and so on. Um, but yeah, what, is, um, what do we know? So it all started back in 2005, as I remember correctly, with two mitochondrial genomes of Geodia Neptunia and Tetia Actinia. And Lavrov showed uh, back in time that there um, are also like gene uh, rearrangement between these two species. And there was a larger effort to sequence more, also based on this long range um, PCR sequencing. And they came up with uh, phylogenetic reconstruction of the demospongia, um, which put more evidence on certain nodes. So they included 22 mitochondrial genomes and also showed that uh, there was like a variation in the size, the gene contact, gene order, the rates of sequence evolution. So um, in 2008, there was also uh, one of the largest uh, mitochondrial genome sequence, Superitis super domuncula. It had a lot of like in intergenic regions, inverted repeats, and also palindromic sequences. Also, like um, one, we, we have one of the Posilla sclerit sequenced, and in 2009. Um, we discovered that uh, Echinia strobilina, which is um, in the Dictyoceridae order, um, had um, some more or less like invasions of repetitive uh, hairpin forming elements the involved, uh, which are possibly involved in uh, RNA processing. We 
<clears throat> moved on and sequenced a few more um, representatives of different orders. This uh, one was from uh, an order called Contrilla. And uh, 2011, there was an effort to sequence more freshwater sponges here with Inapsius of Terrenius. Um, and they showed high sequence identity, uh, which implies also for a recent split of these sponges. And also um, this was shown and um, yeah, by uh, a paper from Warren with uh, the sequencing of Ephidatia, uh, of Ephidatia uh, Müller, Mullery and Spongilla Lacoste. Uh, so with all these, um, Ma and Yang tried to um, think of how we can use all the mitochondrial genomes now to reconstruct um, the phylogenetic relationships of these um, major demosponge orders, and they used it to also calibrate them based on, uh, in total, 24 mitochondrial genomes in 2016. They did a kind of node calibration using 12 fossils, including six with uncertain placements. They came up with this uh, tree here where you can see the uh, uncertainties uh, in, in the arrow bars on the node of the um, branches. And they suggested crown group, uh, or they concluded a crown group uh, demospongia, so the ones um, with non mineralized, so with like. Um, uh, were non-mineralized and uh, appeared um, between 674 and 741 million years. And the mineralized ones uh, apparently in back in the Neoproterozoic. So you can imagine like 600, I mean, sponges were around like more than 600 million years. But still, I mean, this data had um, some troubles in the, um, with the inter- um, order relationships uh, between them because of missing uh, genomes. So in uh, back in 2018, um, I managed during my PhD time um, to get some easy rat sec data, which were actually aimed for something completely different, but they were full of microbes. So maybe this would have been something for Beate, but for me it was uh, a disaster, but still what I could uh, do is I could extract the mitochondrial genome of some rock sponges, and these are pretty cool sponges because they um, have a very good fossil record. So with six new mitochondrial genomes of these rock sponges, we um, did uh, another um, tip dating um, analysis uh, including 33 mitochondrial genomes and over 30 fossils, and came up with this um, dated uh, tree. And you can see um, that we also included one sponge called Vetulina stalactitis in green, which is a sister clade to the uh, freshwater sponges. And it was actually the first time that we could uh, determine the split of marine and freshwater sponges. Um, with this uh, sequencing effort. But we also um, included quite some um, in, in, in the other gray, uh, what you can see in the other gray box, uh, some other uh, tetractinellida and could date when they first originated. So there's a lot of controversial going on when the first uh, demo sponges originated. But with this data, um, at least from what we know so far, we um, concluded that there was a neoproterozoic origin of the demospongia, and the split of freshwater and marine sponges were in the Carboniferous. But this also showed that there was a very recent radiation of freshwater sponges and the diversification of the order Tetractinellida, which um, is also a major group within the whole Demospongia, was dated to about 350 million years back. So yeah, what's next? There were still um, a lot of um, yeah, missing taxa and, and, include, uh, yeah, uh, and hypotheses, which were still lacking. So there was a huge, um, effort by the RISCO and a RISCO group, um, including 
um, Bruna Blaise, but also Nathan to sequence a whole lot more um, transcriptomes and they were able to um, extract a lot um, of the mitochondrial genome from this data as well. So at the end, we, um, we added 14 new mitochondrial genomes to the previous work um, and in total, uh, 68 mitochondrial genomes were included in this um, analysis. And you can see here that um, it was also the first one where we showed that uh, the keratose so is a sister to all the other, uh, so geromorpha and heteroscleromorpha. And um, we also included so with the sequencing effort, we were able to basically um, place even more fossils and use this tip dating, which is basically um, a method where you can place um, various uh, fossils um, in, like in, uh, on the branch and not only use like the oldest fossils, like it is done for node calibration. So with this on the right-hand side, you can see we came up with uh, a more complete um, um, phylogenetic reconstruction and a dated tree. And you can uh, see that we that major uh, clades diverged in the Mesozoic time, but the demo sponge or the crown groups actually emerged quite um, later in, in, in the Mesozoic. Um, yeah, as I told you, mitochondrial gene arrangements occurred as well, and they also play a crucial role and it or can be informative when it comes to evolutionary perspectives. Here you can see a, a schematic linearized mitochondrial genomes from the different uh, clades, the keratosa, the virungomorpha, and heteroscleromorpha. And you can see in, in, so in colors are the conserved regions. You can see also the transpositions, which are marked in the red lines, and some tandem duplication random losses in this um, pink triangle. Um, you can see some regions are more conserved than others, and yeah, this can also be um, yeah um, uh, informative um, uh, character when it comes to evolutionary. Um, hypothesis. Yeah, what is next? Um, here I want to show you some new mitochondrial genomes that will be included soon. We are currently um, extracting some more from, um, for example, Cleona orientalis, because we only had uh, one representative species of Cleonida. But uh, we also added from our work here in Denmark some uh, axinellida, which we found uh, in, a, um, in a marine lake uh, in Ireland, and some, uh, some other um, rock sponges, which belongs to this proposed new suborder, which also have a fossil record. So there will be a couple of rearrangements in the topology here and another uh, uh, species of the Dictyoseritida. Yeah, the gene expression in sponge mitochondrial exposed to varied uh, in situ oxygen concentration is another topic that I just briefly want to mention. So we went to this lake in Ireland, as I was uh, telling you before, and this lake is very special because it has a uh, oxygen minimum zone. So we have samples from uh, hypoxic and anoxic, but also non-oxic conditions uh, from this place here called the Labra Cliff. And what we did is we tried, so we have transcriptomic work uh, uh, done and also sequenced, and we assembled the mitochondrial genome um, of, of the reference transcriptomes and actually um, saw so that all protein coding genes in all oxygen conditions um, were recovered and there was no significant change in the gene expression. So here you can see in all in, in the boxes, the different genes um, yeah, on the left, the norm oxic, in the middle, the anoxic, and on the right, the hypoxic conditions. And um, 
yeah, we had some repli replicates. So yeah, future re research questions might well be if the mitochondrial function like normally under low oxygen. So this is one of the research questions we want to answer in the future. But there's still um, a lot to do with all the data, um, what we have. So yeah, in conclusion, mitogenomes um, provide a robust phylogenetic benchmark. Um, it, we still, um, yeah, they remain under uh, investigated in most demo sponge orders. They are useful for the analysis of uh, synapomorphies such as skein or losses of specific genes, but they also give interesting insights into the expression levels of experimental data as just uh, shown in last slides, but um, yeah, to understand all of this, we definitely need more mitogenome sequenced, um, but we are getting closer and closer to, yeah, um, better understand how the evolution um, and the biology of these, um, yeah, sponges uh, work, basically. So with this, I would like to, yeah, Thank everyone for the attention and the invite. And this work was, uh, yeah, um, not only 